All right, good afternoon. And welcome to The Promise of an Async Future Awaits, which I've gotten kudos for for being the most interesting talk title. And I got all the important keywords in the title. We're done. No. So the story behind this talk is C Sharp has had async and await and task and task of T and this task based asynchronous programming model since version 5. Now I work on the .NET Docs team and I am primarily responsible for everything related to C Sharp. We thought we had a bit of a problem in terms of we really didn't think developers understood this model particularly well. So we started tracking issues on that, and we made a project on our repo for everything related to await, async, task, task of T, continue with, when all, when any, and wait all, wait any, and all that. And we just started collecting the issues that came in based on articles about those and based on those concepts. This project has more issues than any other sub-area of .NET that we write about. So clearly, we have not explained it extremely well. That's where this talk has grown, grown out of, is I'm taking all these issues, and we're going to redo a lot of the documentation around this concept because we think we made it harder than it had to be. We think the concepts aren't as hard. We think the language itself puts some very nice features in play for you to do asynchronous programming. And we've struggled to explain it well and to give a mental model that will work. So the arc of this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine something that we do every day, or pretty close to every day, describe it to another human the way we would describe it, look at how a computer would actually execute those steps, and point out that that really isn't what we want. And then we'll start to talk about what asynchronous means in terms of how we want to make this work, and what would that do to our code to make it execute the way we want it to be done, and yet still be able to describe it in a way that is crystal clear. And then in the last 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to expand on what Mads had talked about yesterday on things that are coming in C Sharp 8, and talk about async streams, which takes these concepts and moves them a little bit into the kind of things that we're doing now that have data sources that are bringing us data from another place, and they come in batches, and so on. And we want to be able to work with those in a good way. So here's the analogy that we're going to do. We're going to make breakfast, which is a task all of us know how to do. And we've described it to others. So what are we going to do? I'm going to make an American breakfast. Because when I started to research and put it together for this talk here, I learned that an English breakfast means something different in different places. So I didn't want to get sidetracked, so I said, OK, we'll do an American breakfast. I'm going to pour a cup of coffee first, because before I get coffee, I'm not doing anything. At least I'm not going to do anything successfully. So I'm going to pour a cup of coffee. I want to fry two eggs. I want to have three slices of bacon. I'm going to toast two pieces of bread. I'm going to add butter and jam to the bread once it's toasted. And then I'm going to pour orange juice. And now I'll sit down and eat. Now, if I were to write that in code, it looks a lot like this. Move it out of the way. I'm going to pour my coffee, put it in a coffee object. I'm going to fry the eggs. After that's done, I'm going to fry the bacon. I'm going to toast the bread. I'm going to apply the butter. I'm going to apply the jam. I'm going to pour the OJ. Everything's ready. I'm going to sit down and eat. This is a very clear description of what we're doing. It reads one step after the other. It's exactly what happens. Now, if I execute this code, the way it runs, OK, I've poured coffee, warming up the egg pan. I've got the eggs in there. The eggs are ready. I put the bacon on. Now I flip the bacon. Now the bacon's done. Now I put toast in the toaster, put the jam on, poured the OJ, and breakfast is ready. Now, I shortened a lot of the timeouts there because Nobody wants to just watch that program run. But you can see that what happens is if I do it, do those steps exactly as this is written, I'm not really going to be happy. Did the eggs. They're sitting on a plate. They're getting cold. I'm watching the bacon. That's happening. I'm doing the jam. I'm doing this. And then finally I eat. 
when we describe what we do to another human, when we describe the steps we take and we describe those to another human, we describe them something like this. It's very linear. This is what you do. But that other human who probably has some experience in a kitchen and probably cooks doesn't execute them like this. They're going to start warming up the pan. Now I'm going to warm up the bacon pan and start the bacon. You know, depending on how long I think each part takes, after I flip the bacon, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to start the toast. I'm going to come back, watch the bacon, get that off, get the bacon off when it's totally done. Now the toast is done, put the butter and jam on, and then pour the, the OJ. So I'm doing these things asynchronously, even though I have written the instruction in a synchronous, linear fashion. That's the mental model we want to have about asynchronous programming in C Sharp. I'm going to write something that looks synchronous and looks like it executes one after the other. And the compiler is going to do some magic to rearrange how this code executes so that it happens asynchronously. Okay, so that's the first part of this mental model. Think about the fact that what we're doing here is nothing really special but really translating instructions, just like we give another person, into the actions that they would take. Right? When we first taught our kids to start cooking, they might do it something like this. They would stand there and just watch something happen. Okay, now it's ready for the next step, and they would stand there and watch it. As we get more experience, we do it in a different way. So that's our steps. Now, here's the next thing that we did really bad when we started to explain this. And when we started to even design the APIs and to work with things. Asynchronous programming might look a lot like parallel programming. Because everyone knows multi-threaded programming is hard. We started to think this must be hard because it works the same way. And we have this mental model where so often we think that things are Asynchronous means parallel, and it's doing something different. If I go back to these instructions in this program, if this were to be parallel, I would want different CPUs doing each one of those steps, or different threads doing each one of those steps. And they would be synchronously waiting for something to happen. It would be like if I brought all of my family in to cook breakfast, and our youngest watches the toast, one you know, that's a little bit more experienced and has done a little bit more cooking, you work with the eggs, you know, I'll watch the bacon, and so on. Now let's think of the difference in what that means in terms of scale for what we want for our programs. What I really want is something that's asynchronous. One person can be in the kitchen, I'll start one task, and I'll go do something else until I need to respond to something that happened over here on this task, and then I'll come back and do that part. Meanwhile, this one is doing something, and I can start something else. I get a signal when I reach a certain point. Right? The most obvious one is when I put bread in the toaster and press the button. Toast pops. I can hear the toaster pop. I know I have to go do something else. That's asynchronous. So now, here's why we, we want to really be explicit about which one of these models we use. Suppose you're building something that's a large-scale web application that's going to be used by thousands of people. If I want to scale it out by going parallel, and I'm going to have each CPU take a request, do the steps in order, blocking on each one of those, that thread spends a lot of time blocked and waiting, as does every other thread. A request comes in, thread does something, waits synchronously doing nothing, does something else, waits synchronously doing nothing, and so on. What that means is as we get more and more people accessing this website, we don't scale out very well, because we've got all these threads sitting there going, I'm waiting for something to finish. I can't respond to another incoming request. But if I correctly do it asynchronously, now what happens is that one thread can start something. Oh, I'm going to need some data from a database. I'm going to make a database call. OK, I'm ready to handle another incoming request. So now I can get that request and start doing something else until it's off to the database. Or, oh, this data came back from the database. Formulate the page, send the page back, or send the API call back. So by being asynchronous, 
I get much, much better scale out because I keep those CPUs as busy as possible. The CPUs aren't sitting there waiting for something to finish as they would if this was a synchronous blocking operation. Right? So that's what we want to do. We want to take this and we're going to say, you know what? I really can do this with one cook. I can make this happen more quickly, but I'm going to asynchronously do it. I'm going to start a task, let that task proceed, and then we'll come back when I get signaled and I will do some extra work. So that's our main key in terms of how we're going to put this together. So now let's look at our, our code here. What I want to be able to do is I need to change some of these steps so that I can start something and then come back and do more work later. All right, so let's start with the eggs. Because pouring coffee is a synchronous operation. Nothing is happening until I get the coffee. So we'll keep that synchronous. So we'll go to fry eggs. All right. I want to signal that I'm doing something asynchronously, so I'm going to end that with the async suffix. Great. I'm going to change its signature to return a task of egg. And I'm getting some red squiggles here where I return the egg. So I need to make this an async method. Great. So I'm telling the compiler to do things asynchronously and return when we're done. I'm getting a green squiggle here because right now I'm not actually awaiting anything. So internally in here, for this demonstration, I just, to start with a synchronous version, I synchronously waited here. I want to await these. So as part of this, this demonstration, I did synchronously wait. Don't do that. Please don't. That was a bad example. This is a better example. If I want to have something take some time, I'm going to await. I'm also not using thread.sleep, which is code we've seen in the wild. And the reason thread.sleep is bad is it does synchronously wait, and that thread stays blocked. Await task.delay. It says, all right, in three seconds, in this instance, start again. OK, so now I slide on up to main. And now you see that I have a mismatch in what's getting returned here. I've got eggs, this fry eggs, which is now fry eggs async. It's returning the wrong type. I'm now returning a task of egg. So I need to await it. And I'm getting red squiggles here because I need to now make this an async task of main. There we go. And I think I already upgraded this project, so I should get a build. Make sure that. Good. Zero warnings. Awesome. So that's a feature that was added in C sharp 7.1 is you can now make main an async method. Must return must be a, or must return a task or a task of int. It's the only things that can return. So let's finish this with these other tasks. Bacon takes quite a while. So frying the bacon now. We're going to change its name to fry bacon async. I'm going to do that as a refactoring so it changes where it was called. Once again, I've got some synchronous weights here. I want to await that. Bacon needs to get cooked on both sides. So we're going to await it as well. And this now is an async method that returns a task of bacon. That's a good time to look at just exactly what we think for an asynchronous method and why some of the syntax was chosen the way it does. If I squint a little bit, I can think this is still just returning bacon when it's done. I'm, my return statement is return new bacon. I like that. It's now async, so its actual signature is async task of bacon. So the compiler is doing some magic for me to make this result that I'm returning the result of the task. So there's some work the compiler does that, that changes that so that the signature matches what's declared for the method. But in my return statement, I'm actually just giving it the, the thing that is returned by the task rather than the task itself. And once again, we'll come up here. I'm now getting this warning that says, you know, you, you weren't waiting, awaiting this, and it's really a task. So we're going to call this 
await task of bacon. All right, we'll do the same thing with our bread. We're going to toast our bread asynchronously. Async, task of toast. Boom, there we go. Pretty quick and simple refactorings. Not so much that it takes very little time in code to write differently, but this still looks like the same kind of code. I can still reason about its logic very clearly. And then await. Squiggles are all gone. Life is good. Okay, So I can reason about this just by reading. And I will await this here. OK, so this looks good. I like this. So some things I like about the syntax and things that making this shift from doing this synchronously, where how we wrote it is exactly how it executes, to something that looks more asynchronous. It's a little bit more like what we would do in real life. But if I do a little bit of a code review, if we take just one of the methods, there's only a couple changes to write an asynchronous algorithm. I put the async modifier on the method. I change the signature to make sure it's returning something like a task. And where I need to, I await something inside that method. OK, that looks good. I like that. It really isn't that hard. I can squint, and I can still kind of go, well, if it were synchronous, it would look like this. And now if we look at the code that calls that method, it looks very similar once again. I'm just starting these things, I'm awaiting them, and then I move on with the rest of the algorithm. So we're partway there. This still looks pretty similar. So if I run it now, I should be super happy. My breakfast, everything should get done about the same time, and I should eat when it's ready. Wait a minute. Hmm. This is working the same way. That's kind of a bummer. But it scales. Yes, but it scales better. So if I were making now 100 breakfasts, this would work better because as I started something and I'm awaiting it, well, I could be starting someone else's breakfast. So in a, as, as the gentleman up here kind of pointed out, if this were in a web farm, web kind of thing where I'm, where I'm trying to respond to multiple requests and lots of requests coming quickly, I can now do that. This may be enough in a lot of cases. That's pretty cool. If this were a UI app and I wanted to be trying to move things around and interact with the window, this would be enough as well. Because now I've started a task, and while that task is doing its thing, the CPU can be doing other things. So in many scenarios, this is all you need. But in this instance, for this one person trying to make breakfast, I haven't really done the simulation that I want. OK? So the lesson so far, let's take a brief break and look at what we've done. We've added a couple keywords. I'm now awaiting any time that's happening, anything that's happening asynchronously, instead of blocking until it completes. And I've changed the signature of methods. Anything that would, would have previously been void, like my main method, now returns a task. Anything that returned some t, like the eggs or the bacon, now returns a task of t. So this is really the mental model I want everyone to have when you're writing anything that's asynchronous. We all know how to write methods and functions. A void returning method is a method that does some work. And when that method exits, that work has been done. Any method that returns some value is a method that does some computation, creates a value, and then returns that value. By analogy, once I start doing something asynchronous, any method that does some work returns a task. And I can ask the task in my code, are you done yet? Or please continue with this once you finish what that task was. Anything that returns a task of t is a method that performs some calculation and is now going to return a task object so I can determine when it finishes. And when it has finished, I can retrieve the result from that task. 
So just like today in any synchronous program that you write, you create methods that perform actions and you create functions that compute values. When you're writing an asynchronous program, what you're going to do is write functions that return task if they do some action, or task of t if they are going to do some action that returns a value over time. That's the key concept to put in your head anytime you work with this. Once you have that, now you can start composing these things in a way that works asynchronously. Because I started writing this synchronously from the get-go, I wrote it in such a way that I'm not really getting all the advantages I want out of async. It's operating exactly as we wanted to have it run. And I'm awaiting each one of those tasks and not doing anything else while it happens. Uh, I, can, I can fix that. I'm going to now, I'm just going to change these. Well, we'll make this a task of eggs. And I will rename this as my eggs task. And now I don't want that await. So now, that's now a variable, an object, that is that task, that represents that work. This will now continue after I've started it, and I will start working on the next task. Okay, Because the eggs are in the pan, they're cooking away, I can be doing something else. So we'll make that same refactoring here on the other asynchronous tasks. Uh -huh. Now, before I can apply the butter and apply the jam, I've, I, it's got to come out of the toaster, right? I mean, I suppose I could put the butter in the toaster, but that might not end well. So I'm going to write here, I'm just going to await the toast, say, my toast is await the toast task. Great. And now before my breakfast is ready, I need to have all those tasks finish. So I'm just going to go await task dot when all. And I made some eggs. So I've got my eggs task. I made the bacon. Yeah. And I should, even though it should be, I'm going to await the toast task again, just to be explicit about it. Now, I should probably move these because I'll leave those in, in there at the moment, just because it'll be illustrative as to what our next step is. So now what I've done is I've started these tasks. I'm caching those task variables, right? So it's, going, it's, a, it's a thing that's going to return eggs or bacon when it's done. And until then, it's a task that's running. And I'm going to await it at the end. That's when I take stuff out of the pan. So now if I run this, I'm going to say, yep, yep, OK, I've got stuff going. Look at that. The stuff's already in the toaster. It's in the bacon in the pan. I'm flipping it, the bacon over. The OJ is already ready. Put the eggs in the plate. OK, everything's ready. That's nice. And notice how it executed faster. I didn't synchronously wait for each one of those things to finish. OK, that's pretty good. This code now has a little bit of ugliness to it, though, because, well, I'm saying that the eggs and bacon are ready as soon as I started the tasks. They're not really done then. And I don't like that extra wait to do the toast thing where I put the toast in, it comes back up. It's now in this method. I had to await it separately. And no, that's not what I want at all. So let's take these three lines right here. And I'm going to put them in a local function. And that's going to return just a task. And we'll return our toast. Toast with butter and jam. And that's going to take in a task of toast. And now if I put those lines in this local method, it's called my bread toasting, because that'll be a 
Good name for that. Okay, so now if we look at this, and then we can return our toast. Now that's just creating a function that composes tasks. One of the things that we've used, the phrase we've used often here is don't compose sync over async. When I had that await up above and I said, okay, stop everything, wait for the toast and then do this, this code, I was bringing that, back, that task back up and then I was doing some more work with it and that extra work was synchronous. And about three minutes ago I said, we can think of our composition with asynchronous programs the same way we think of it as how we would do it with synchronous programs. I did some work and now I'm doing some more work. That initial work means a function call and then when I'm doing some more work, that's what happens after that function call and that can be in its own function. That's what I've done right here. I take in this task of toast, where my toast is, is in the toaster, and the thing that happens later, which is technically referred to as a continuation, I put that in the same method. So now what I've done is I have composed a task. So my input here is a task that when it's finished, I'm gonna do some more work. So because what came in was asynchronous, this is now an asynchronous method and therefore must return a task. In this case, it's a task of toast. So now up here, we're gonna call this, and here now my toast task is just this dot And I said toast with butter and jam, right? IntelliSense is in my way. Although I can't, I should, if I make that an extension method, I could do that. And here as I call it, it now becomes kind of obvious what I'm doing. I'm starting a task, and then I'm passing that task to another function to say, you know, when that first task finishes, do some other things. And when you do those other things, then return now different toast, it's now got butter and jam, right? That's programming with composition of tasks. All I have to do once I start to see this pattern is realize that I just need to move some code around and put it into methods that will return a task. Anytime you see this pattern that says, do these things and when that finishes, do some other stuff, that's writing a couple asynchronous functions. Just like right now you would say, well, step one is this, step two is this, step three is that, that might be three method calls. Same basic concept, but now we're just carrying along some extra information in the form of a task. Okay, so does this mental model start to make more sense? As we start to see this? So now let's, I'm gonna do the same thing with my eggs and bacon being ready, but I'm gonna do it in a different way because I already have some methods down here. Since I had a method that was making my eggs, I'm just gonna put the eggs already down here inside that method because I already am doing some composition. But I could do the same thing by taking the eggs and the bacon and putting it, putting it in a local function to do more work there. And any of these can be put together, put together in different ways. So at any one of these await points, basically what you're doing is saying, after this thing finishes, then execute the continuation. If it's in the same method, the task will finish when all of those things are done. If it's in different methods, you'll pass the task in and retrieve a new task out. It's done when all those things are finished. Cool. Now if I run this, I think we get a pretty good mental model as to how this is gonna work. Cool. Da, 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 da. Pour in the coffee, put stuff in, and now you can see as things finish, I've already put the butter and jam in the toast, put the eggs in the plate, the eggs are ready, flip the bacon, second part of the bacon is done, breakfast is ready. <coughs> yes. And that's now all the complexity you really need to make this work. I started three different tasks. Those are composed of subtasks. And then when those tasks are finished, my breakfast is ready. It sounds a lot like what we do every day. 
And if you look at this code now, and this is where the syntax is, is rather pleasant, and we hope leads to an understanding once you start to really see and get this metal model, and we explain it better, this still reads the way we would communicate to another person how to make the breakfast. Start from here, start moving this through, and then when all those things are done, everything's ready. Simple, right? We hope. Now there's a few things because of the age of the API and because it was built on top of some things that came before that make this a little bit nastier. And there's a couple things that we're going to work with. All right, so as we said, cooking bread synchronously it looks pretty much like this. We went through and we changed it. And now it looks a little bit like this. Changed the name, I think, in the slide from what I did here, but pretty much the same kind of thing. The same logic is still there as I read it. Now, a couple of the things that people run into a lot before I get to async streams that are probably the most common questions we get. And it is where I think in every higher level language, almost anything we do, any abstraction we do, at some point in time, at some point you get far enough into it that the abstraction leaks a little bit. When we're dealing with async and await and tasks, the place that leaks is where we get to dealing with a synchronization context or the context that code runs on. So you'll see things, and we do this in our docs, and we explain where we also will say something like continue, configure await false. And we say you should do this. But a lot of times we don't really say why that well. And here's where the abstraction kind of hurts people. The reason this doesn't compile is configure await actually returns a different kind of awaitable than a task. Um, so if I were just to make this a var, because it's, it's actually an I async awaitable, I think, or a configure await context. And I probably have to change that as well. Um, And in, in this application, it's a console application, so I don't really need to do anything with configure await. And here's where there's times where you need to do it and there's times when you don't. So a common misconception is that a synchronization context equates to a thread. The reality is that a synchronization context equates to a thread except when it doesn't. And the reason is there are special contexts and that have exactly one thread, in particular a UI context. So if you are writing a Windows desktop program, WPF program, WinForms, UWP, Xamarin, there is one thread that is allowed to update controls on the screen, that UI thread. So if you are running in the synchronization context that is allowed to work with the UI, there is exactly one thread that is in that context. And if your continuations, what's actually happening under the covers here, which is why we say this is a part of the abstraction that leaks a little bit, is there's gonna be effectively some things that get hooked up and the compiler creates some gnarly code that says, do this and then hook up an event so that after this thing finishes, now do the rest of this stuff. And that event, by default, is going to be on the same context where the work started, okay? In the case of the UI and a UI application, that will mean on the same thread because there is only one thread in that context. So if this were a windowed program, my tasks would kind of stop and pause in order to switch to execute the code when something else finished and then would come back. If any of these were long running CPU bound applications, that would kind of be a jerky experience for users. And the way you can avoid that is then you say, configure await false, which means the continuation can run in another context, and that other context might be a background thread, might be a thread pull thread, and then when it comes back up to the UI, we're gonna continue at the UI level in the same, U back in the UI context, and then we'll be back on the only thread that can manipulate the UI. So that's the one spot where it leaks. 
if you're in a, writing an ASP.NET or ASP.NET Core application, all of your controllers or everything that's handling a request is on a thread pool thread. The thread pool has more than one thread, hence the name thread pool as opposed to thread. So when you're in that context, continuing on the same context may very well mean a different thread. In fact, in all likelihood, it almost certainly means a different thread in any production scale application. But it will be another thread in the same context because it will be in the thread pool. Okay, so that was a bit of a long-winded explanation. So what's the guidance? And why did we pick the default that is gonna continue on the same, you know, configure await, if I don't put anything, it's like you put configure await true. Why did we make that the default if we tell everybody doing libraries, add configure await false? Well, the reason is configure await true or not doing anything, your code will always work correctly. You may, in certain situations, lose a little bit of responsiveness, particularly at the UI level. Configure await false. If you know what you're doing in the library and you know that the continuation can execute anywhere and you're not taking in a delegate, which might actually be modifying the UI or doing something else that could be bad, you can switch context and it won't hurt. So configure await false means your library is gonna be more responsive. However, if you don't know exactly what's going on and you can't correctly make some of those assumptions, configure await false means your app might crash because somebody using it might update the UI and be in the wrong context. You might deadlock or you might get race conditions. Hence the default is the same as configure await true because it will always work. And not putting it in doesn't cause really bad stuff. I don't have a good demo for that with breakfast, so I'm gonna be working on that as we update the docs. And that's probably the single biggest bit. The key thing of this whole simulation that I want people to remember and to build this mental model of working with async is just like with every bit of code you write, you break things up into methods. Those methods are actions that return void or return some value that they computed. When you move that code into an asynchronous uh, processing model, a, ta a method that does some work returns a, a task. And you use the task to determine when that work finished. And you always, almost always want to know when the task finished. A method that does some work and computes a value returns a task of t. So you ask the task, is it done yet? and you retrieve the value, then you get the co computation that was done asynchronously. Okay, so I'm gonna load up a second solution. And as that loads, yeah, we can save these. We'll talk a little bit about async streams. So async streams, now we're gonna introduce three new interfaces that if you squint, close one eye and look at, are gonna look amazingly familiar. First, in system.collections.generic, we are gonna have I async enumerable. That looks a lot like I enumerable. The difference is the method, instead of being called git enumerator, is called git async enumerator. And it implements I async enumerator instead of I enumerator. And if we look at this I async enumerator, it looks a lot like I enumerator of T. The difference in current looks exactly the same. I'm just gonna get a T. <coughs> move next async looks a lot like move next. Remember what I said about that mental model? Instead of returning a bool, it's gonna return a task that will tell you when it's done and then the bool you can retrieve from the task. Instead of task, it's using value task, which behaves the same way as task, but is an optimization. Value task is a struct, task is a class. For something like enumerating large collections, we can reuse memory and do a lot fewer allocations by making it a struct. And then if you notice, I async enumerator, like I enumerator, implements something that looks a little bit like I disposable, but here's I async disposable. And if you look at I async disposable, 
you can squint a little bit and go, that looks a lot like iDisposable. It has one method. Instead of dispose, it's called dispose async. And instead of returning void, it returns value task. Same mental model I was just going through with in this whole earlier program about making a breakfast asynchronously. Something that was void now returns a task. There we go. So let's look at where we think this is really a cool thing. So I'm going to go around some of the code that's here and talk mostly about the asynchronous parts. So everything we do for Docs is uh, open source on GitHub. And one of the things that we do sometimes is we want to look at new issues as they come in and see what's going on. So here I have this thing. I'm going to run a page query, which is using the GitHub GraphQL library. And the reason I picked GraphQL is GraphQL is a very nice paging library. And then I'm, when it comes back, and this thing is going to be async, I'm going to print out each one of the issues. So let's look at how this is implemented. I'm returning a task of I enumerable of J token. So I'm using the Newtonsoft JSON library. That's already ugly. Task of I enumerable of J token. Whoa. I'm going to create a request. And then when I get each one of those requests back after the I'm going to await here to go make the web request. And then when it comes back, I'm going to parse the results, print stuff out. A couple fields in the response are going to tell me if there are more pages. And then give me a cursor so I can get the next page. So I'm going to stuff those back in. And then I'm going to run the query again until I get all the pages that I asked for. I'm stopping at 10 just because this is a rather large repo. So if you look at the structure of this code, I'm going to make a request put data into an array, see that there's more pages, make another request, add more data to that array, make another request, add more data to that array until I've requested as much as I want, then send the whole thing back and let the caller enumerate it. I picked an overload of this that implements an iProgress API so that I can print out a message when each packet comes back. And it looks like I disconnected from the speaker Wi-Fi. So before I run this, we will get back internet connection. Because this demo doesn't work real well without an internet. Yes. So now when I run it, the way it works, as I said, this kind of before, in a world before async streams, after it builds, you can see we're going to make a request now. We're pausing. And we should get data soon, one hopes. There we go. So now I've got 25 issues. Now I've got 50. And you can see each page is coming back. And then once I get my 10 pages, there's the last 100 or 250 issues that we've received. I like the fact that the last one there, I said async void bad, which is true. OK, so there it came back. Nice stuff. Now, if this were production and in today's world, if I really wanted to access that data as it came back, I would have to do some things like have that I progress start to return the I enumerable and keep track of who's enumerating it and make sure I don't rewrite memory and so on. And a big critique of this program right now is this array has to hold all the results. So if I'm doing a whole lot of work, like say it's an ML program where I'm getting 100 million data points, that's a lot of memory to allocate. If I'm going to stream through it. So let's change this and let's make this doing something to start retrieving these immediately. So let's change all of this and just retrieve an I async enumerable. OK. There we go. That's cool. And now down here, the nice things I can do is I can delete that array because I don't really need to keep track of all that stuff. That's just kind of, I don't want to allocate all that memory and keep having it grow all over the place. And then when this comes back, aha, instead of this, I'm not going to do that because I don't need to merge things. But what I can do is for each J object in, what did I say it was? It is going to be issues. 
of results, subnodes. And yield return issue. Right. Make sure I got that right. I just want to make sure I got that variable name right. Before I deleted that code, I meant to just move it. Yeah. That was exactly what I wanted. Okay. And now, because this is an iAsync I async enumerable, I'm going to skip this progress reporting bit. And because I'm now yield returning, I can remove the return. Since I'm skipping the progress, well, I can get rid of that last, last argument because I don't really need it. And now here, aha. To iterate this, instead of here this await issue in each issues, I'm just going to grab this part of the code. And instead of issues, I'm just going to put it right there. Close bracket. Don't need this. And I'm getting a red squiggle there because I need to await for each it. Cool. OK, so the code looks really just like enumerating a sequence. But now I've just added this await in front of the for each to say, yeah, this is an async stream. It's going to get data back when it gets data back. And down below, instead of i enumerable, I've just said i async enumerable. And I can put some awaits in there each time I need to get a new page. Awesome. And now what I really love about this feature and the things we can do with it is watch what happens differently now as I run this version. I got a chunk of data, and I'm enumerating it. And then I get another chunk of data, and I'm enumerating it, and so on and so forth. OK? Let me just run that one more time to really, really drive that home. Notice how we're going to get, it's going to pause as it makes that first request. Boom. Boom. OK? And this is part of why this interface is implemented the way it is. I async enumerable returns something that is going to hand, you will be able to retrieve the next element when it's available. And if the next element is already in memory or already retrieved from your asynchronous data source, you'll be able to get that immediately and just continue to enumerate. That's why I get that after that first pause, you see 25 issues come out. And then there's a pause. At some point, you'll hit a page boundary where you need to make the next request to get the next hunk of data. And at that time, it's asynchronous. Inside the implementation, you'll be able to see that detail. Right? Up here, I'm, I'm making a re request to a web service. I'm getting some data back. And down here, where I'm letting you enumerate the sequence, I'm just going to yield return however many I've downloaded. If I change the page size here from 25 to 50, the chunks would be bigger. If I change it to 10, it would be smaller. Here where I'm enumerating it and iterating it, it doesn't matter. I'm iterating the sequence. You'll get the next element immediately if it's already downloaded. But without changing anything that you're doing here to enumerate the sequence, when the source has to do some asynchronous work to get the next piece of data, the source will enumerate or we'll go asynchronous, you'll have to await here and then get the next one. The only part I didn't demonstrate here is if I moved my GitHub client object down into this method, it would be disposed after the await finishes. Another couple bits of nice things here. I wouldn't have to implement cancellation and cancellation source in something like this. How do I cancel and not make more web requests? Just stop enumerating the sequence. I would not make another row request, because if I look at the implementation here, <coughs> let's say I stopped after the first 10 issues came back. That yield for each would return the first 10. There's say still 15 in this instance in memory. And I don't loop back up to the next part of the loop and make another request. So cancellation is automatic. I just stop reading from the async stream, 
And then up here, it's currently in main, but if this were like somewhere in a service layer, if I stop for reaching this and that, the return of run page query, once that goes out of scope, it's going to get disposed of, and any connections would automatically get closed. So the mental model now, it's just like enumerating a synchronous sequence, and the compiler is going to generate the code to automatically cancel if you stop enumerating, right? just because you won't make any more asynchronous requests, and automatically clean up after the enumerable goes out of scope, or after the enumerator goes out of scope. Awesomeness. <laughs> My kids say that all the time. <laughs> cool. All right. So again, reviewing. Key point is you start to play with this feature. If you just squint a little bit, it looks just like what you're using today. There you go. So it should be really familiar. And generating a sequence, it's going to look a lot like what you do today, except instead of returning an I enumerable, you return an I async enumerable. Add the async modifier on the method, and you can use awaits inside the code that's going to generate the sequence. And with that, we've worked through those. Cool. Last little bit I want to talk about, kind of shifting gears a bit is in the last month, the .NET Foundation has now opened and announced open membership. Okay. What this really is, is .NET kind of growing up and trying to have more of a stake for those people, like all of you, who paid to come to a conference to learn more things and went in this room because you want to learn more about .NET, to have your own professional organization. .NET Foundation has I think 287 projects was the last number I saw. Some of them are projects that started at Microsoft. Many of them are all community-driven projects. If you have participated in any of those projects, whether that's writing issues on any of our repos, contributing to our docs, submitted PRs either to one of the Microsoft repos or to XUnit or to any of the projects that you work with, you can become a member. And notice I said if you've contributed issues and participated in discussions, you don't have to have written a pull request. If you go to this .netfoundation.org slash become a member, you can read all the details. Think of it as your professional organization. If you care about the future of .NET and its direction, this is the organization that's going to be setting that direction. Board elections will be next month. So joining now means you would participate and vote on the board. Bylaws have been changed so that any corporate member can have no more than two people on the board. So only two Microsoft employees at most will be on this. Uh, Beth Massey, it's been announced, has been the one board seat Microsoft gets to a point one. Anyone else who wants to run, if you are a member, you can also run for the board. All the information is once again on some links that will be on the Become a Member. Think of it as your professional society, professional organization for .NET. If you are interested, please, please consider it. Any questions? Yes, I'll start right there. When, when does a task start executing? In C Sharp, a task starts executing as soon as you call the code that's in that method. It will execute up to the first await. And it will only go asynchronous once it hits the first await that's awaiting a non-completed task. So in C Sharp, all tasks start running. Uh, I, don't I don't believe we have any syntax to do to start a, to create a task, but then start it later. You can do it uh, in the library, but, um, but not the language. The language yeah. generated tasks don't do that. They start right away. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I saw a hand go up somewhere over here. I thought yes. Uh, what was the motivation between? Um, Ah, so what was the motivation of adding two keywords to have async and await in order to split those two? Um, I may defer to you on that one. 
Come on up to the mic. I think there's one. I thought I was done. Sorry. <laughs> Is that one on or should I stand? I, I bet they can do that back there. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that was, of course, a discussion point. Should, uh, what, why do we have two keywords? Can't we just recognize that there's an await in the method, for instance, and then um, reason that it's async? And uh, we actually did make that choice for iterators, where we recognize there's a yield keyword, and we, we realize that this method has to be an iterator. Uh, we decided that we didn't want to do that because the, um, the await can be really deeply buried. Now, an await expression is an expression. It can be really deeply inside some code, and it can be hard to just look at a piece of code and see there's an await in there. Whereas the yield is a statement, so it's a little more, um, it's a little more visible at least. And I also think we probably made a mistake with the yield. I think we should have had a keyword for the iterators as well. Um, so the async is primarily there to make it clear that this is an async method. Um, it also helps uh, with some compiled technical things of avoiding ambiguity, uh, because the await wasn't a keyword all the time. People could have had things that were called await. They could have a, you know, a method or variable called await, and we, would, um, we had to kind of respect that kind of code. But the async keyword is new. So whenever you have async, we know that await inside is, an, is the keyword await, and <coughs> somebody's declared await. Mm -hmm. Does that explain it? Yeah. Cool. I'll run back down. Yeah. Any others? Let's start right there. And then we'll do next. Yeah. Isn't it redundant to having async and then task? Is it redundant to write async and then task? No. Um, probably the quickest way to explain it is, once again, if we look. Da, da, da. Yeah, here. Um, in C Sharp 7.2, a feature got snuck in that was called generalized async return types. And one of those is, well, actually, you can see an example of both of the things where that's important here. If you notice, um, iAsync disposable, dispose async returns a value task. And here, this also returns a value task of, voo, of bool. And the reason for that, in this instance, to use value task is because there's some optimizations that can be made and some memory allocations that we don't need for that. So the compiler now recognizes that an async method doesn't have to return a task. It has to return something that has the right pattern and the right methods so that it can be awaited. Okay. The second reason for that is if you look at IAsync enumerator or IAsync enumerable itself, we can await that because we recognize that pattern. Mm -hmm. And then the next question was right there. I thought, yeah. Uh, I want the reason why you have dot result and dot wait and dot get await and dot get result in the task. Why do we have task.wait, task.result, get awaiter, and get result? Um, probably mostly historical. There were times when you needed to do something synchronous at some point, bubble up to it, so it's there. But I would, I would recommend moving forward that that would probably be a code spell anytime I see a dot .wait or a dot .result, like I started with in the async breakfast. When I saw a task.delayed .wait, yeah, I, I would really try to avoid that. I have, I have uh, interns and, 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 and new, newly, new, new people to CCR, they always uh, fall for that. Yeah. They got stuff. I think, I, know, I, I am pretty sure that there's a project, a NuGet project called .NET Analyzers that I think finds that. And it will give you, if you install that analyzer in your project, it will give you analyzer warnings if someone does those. I can look that up for you after as we get done. One last question, and then I will make sure the next person gets up here. OK, way back there. Oh, dear. Why doesn't you let async take a cancellation token? Why doesn't move next async take a cancellation token? Because it really doesn't need one. All I have to do to cancel this is don't ask for it. I could, so the question is, or the assertion was, I could ask for it and then later decide I would cancel it. If we look at the code that I wrote here, let's say you've asked for the first 25 and now you've asked for the 26th element. So I have nothing here in this yield return. I'm going to go to the issues return plus equals whatever. Come back up here. There's more pages and I'm going to make a web request. So before it actually awaits, I sent that packet. 
right? So I've made that asynchronous request. So cancel at that point is meaningless until it comes back, because the rest of this is going to execute anyway. Okay, so one of the things that we said earlier in the current model is that if you support cancellation, cancellation should actually mean that you can cancel it. Once I've already made the web request, it's already out there on another machine. So cancel really doesn't do anything other than throwing away the results when they get back. Okay? Good question, though. At this point, I'm going to make sure the next person can set up, but I will be more than happy to take questions individually up here. Uh, I want to thank you for all of your time. And please, if you like this analogy, please give me feedback on that, either here on Twitter or if you look at the repo, create issues, because I think this is a, has been a good way to explain the concepts. And that's one of the things I'm going to be doing in terms of reworking the docs. Thank you very much for your time.